Well, collectors, here we are once again. Uh, welcome to the next seminar. Today is September the 27th, 2020. And today we're going to talk about the Hunting, Forestry, and Shooting Associations. Uh, but has been my uh, uh, bit before doing the seminar, uh, we always show you a couple of pieces from my personal collection. So we'll start out doing that uh, before we go downstairs uh, to the pool table where we do the seminar. So we're in the collecting room, so I'll show you these, these swords. I think you'll enjoy looking at them. on the table here so it can be seen. Maybe I'll turn it this way. But... Uh, this is a sword uh, that comes from uh, about 1900 or possibly in the 1890s and um, it's a colonial sword. Uh, see the special eagle that's on the uh, the grip, the, the guard, I should say. Uh, and then the sword also has an imperial crown on the top of it. Uh, this is because the colonial troops were under the direct order of the Kaiser. Uh, and these were officers and men uh, that were assigned to the colonies in Africa and also um, in China. Uh, this particular example uh, comes from uh, an African owner. Uh, it was given to uh, an infantryman with a blue panel and gold inlay. Um, it's uh, just a beautiful thing and on the other side it has lots of um, uh, writing uh, concerning the uh, uh, presentation. It's a it's a retirement sword. Oh, I had it up that I had it right the first time. Sorry about that. I think you can get enough light there to to see the presentation. It's a very beautiful blade, and it comes complete in a uh, a nickel scabbard. And it's in um, absolute uh, mint condition uh, and a very, very rare sword. As you know, there were uh, not a lot of um, uh, officers assigned to these places. Uh, so I count myself very lucky uh, to have gotten this one. Now I'll show you another sword. Okay, collectors, this next sword uh, is actually a um, sample sword from one of the Icorn showrooms. And if you look in the Icorn Kundendienst, the catalog, uh, they picture a couple of their showrooms and you can see this particular sword uh, in the window. And the reason for the sword, you'll notice it has a, a basket hilt with a celluloid grip, uh, but the blade tells the whole story of the sword. Uh, it's all in Damascus, and what's interesting about it uh, it has the raised uh, original Icorn Blanca Waffen. In other words, the name of the Icorn firm is on the obverse. Uh, and if we look at the reverse, you can probably see a little bit better. The sword has the different fullers that were available for people that wanted to order them so that they could see what they looked like. Beautiful Damascus, still in mint condition, and a very impressive sword. I love the way the, uh, uh, the name is raised out and gilded, and it comes with a brown scabbard. Uh, that's a composition material. It's kind of delicate uh, with beautiful fittings that nicely match the hilt. 
Okay, and I'll show you one more sword, and then we'll start the seminar. Okay, this next sword um, is one of the swords that I have in my naval collection. I have a number of really nice naval swords, but I particularly like this one and thought I would show it to you. Um, it's a standard naval sword on, on the hilt, uh, having the folding clamshell, ivory grip, and uh, the original portapi is still with it. Um, but what is really interesting with the sword is the um, beautiful blade, which has a raised dedication, uh, which is gilded, uh, and it was given um, uh, dem scheidenden Kameraden, that means the, our retiring comrade, uh, Lieutenant Freiherr, uh, can't pronounce his name, but you can see that, uh, and it comes from the officers of the Marine Infantry. Now the Marine Infantry was very similar to the Marines in America. Uh, they guarded the coasts of occupied countries. Um, and this man obviously was an officer uh, with the Marine Infantry. And, and what's incredible with the sword, on the reverse of it, Get my ash off of here. On the reverse of it, it has also raised and gilded uh, all of the places and the ships uh, and the dates uh, when this officer served in those areas. You can see Qing Tao here, which was in China, and also he was, he was in um, uh, Germany too. But it's more or less a complete record of his whole career, all in one sword. What a wonderful retirement gift. Certainly give you something to remember your experience by. So he must have been well respected uh, by the men under him that probably uh, contributed to have this sword made. A very beautiful thing. Okay, and uh, with that, we'll go downstairs and we'll start the um, seminar on uh, hunting, forestry, and shooting. Well, here we are, some antics for you. I thought since we're doing a, a, a hunting seminar, maybe I could put my Jaeger hood on and show you this beautiful shotgun that I also have in my collection. It's definitely worth a peek. So I'll come over and show you that. It has all Damascus barrels on it. And the, uh, it's got the hammers on it, and the, this area is all engraved. And then on the, uh, oh, you can see the sides of it are all engraved. And it also has the name of the man in gold that made it, made it a man from uh, uh, Regensburg. His name was uh, H. Uh, Ziergel, Z-I-R-E. G I H L, and then also the um, the stock is all uh, checkered and beautifully carved. And I'm sure that any anyone in the German hunting society probably had a nice shotgun like this. Okay, now we'll get to the heart of the matter here. Put this gun down before I shoot myself. Okay, the uh, the German Hunting Society um, was formed centuries ago. Uh, it was a, a more like a, a country club in Germany uh, than anything else. Uh, the uh, game was all controlled by uh, aristocratic families who owned the lands, uh, and in order to become a hunter. The um, restrictions were, um, were terrific. 
uh, geared towards conservation. Uh, you took a couple of years to be able to qualify for a license, uh, and it was um, it was a big deal. Uh, it was not like in this country where you could just uh, grab a shotgun and run into a field and uh, shoot a rabbit or a pheasant. It was highly, highly controlled. And of course, under the Third Reich time, it was controlled by uh, Hermann Goering, who was the Jägermeister. Uh, but before we get into the topic, I want to talk about the background just a little bit. Um, during the medieval times, uh, there was a legend that developed uh, surrounding a hunter by the name of Hubertus. Uh, Hubertus was out in the forest and he came across this white, huge stag, the biggest animal and most beautiful animal he had ever seen. And he was cocking his uh, crossbow, uh, getting ready to shoot the animal, when all of a sudden an aura appeared over the animal's head. And the animal spoke to him, saying that if you kill me, the best of the breed, uh, then you'll no longer have fine game. Uh, and this uh, was sort of, people thought of it as it was the voice of God. So it became a legend in Germany, the legend of Hubertus, and uh, uh, you'll see it all the time. It's a stag head with a sun ray in the middle with a, with a cross, and the Nazis changed it to a, a Hockenkreuz, but it's basically the same thing. But here in this photo, this uh, painting is Hubertus and the white stag and the cross above. Um, a very important thing uh, with learning about um, hunting. So that's Hubertus. Now hunting cutlasses, uh, we call them Hirschfangers. And uh, what does that mean? Well. Hirsch means deer, and Fonger means kill, so it's a deer killer, in effect, is what the name of the cutlass is. Um, they had cutlasses for centuries, of course. Um, when we come into the imperial time and the Third Reich time, uh, the cutlasses that we collect are mainly ceremonial. Uh, they were not really used, they were, they were just to be worn with the uniform. Uh, all hunters had their basic um, cutlasses that they used when they were game hunting, and they weren't anywhere near as fancy as the things that I'll show you. So this first cutlass I want to show you uh, comes from about 1860 from my personal collection, and it's one of my favorite pieces. Uh, the fittings are all carved silver, um, absolutely beautiful, and the clamshell has a head of an owl on it. Uh, I suspect that the cutlass was probably made for uh, someone in the hunting organization that everybody respected highly for his wisdom. Uh, and this is a massive piece. I'll show you the blade. Uh, it's extremely wide. And the size of the spine is incredible. It's very, very heavy. Beautiful thing. And then it has a skinner with it also. Um, and on the scabbard, it's of brown leather. On the back, there's an old museum tag. So I suspect that this was probably in a German museum, probably during the Second World War, and uh, one of our GIs apparently helped himself, but don't tell anybody. But isn't that, isn't that a beautiful thing? Look at the detail in the, in the carving, and it just, uh, oh, it's, it's just an amazing piece. Absolutely beautiful. One of my favorites, as I say. This is a short cutlass, and this would uh, be really called like a salfonger for a, uh, uh, the final kill on a wild boar. Now I'll show you another type of cutlass. Uh, this particular piece is um, Hessian, 
and it would have been worn by an Ober Forester. Uh, this is a man who was with the organization for many, many years and uh, probably had a job working for uh, one of the landowners. Uh, it was a law in Germany that if you had a hunting preserve, uh, it was mandatory that you had a uh, professional uh, forester to, to look over it. Um, we actually call these kind of like a short sword because they were so long, uh, comparing them to a cutlass. It has a beautiful lion head on it, a clamshell, ivory grips. Um, the frog is still with it, which is brocade. And you can see the blade is absolutely immense. Theoretically, they had these kind of long short swords uh, for the final kill on a wild boar. Um, believe it or not, if you were doing the proper job with hunting the boar, uh, you were expected to stand in front of him with this short sword and hope that the damn boar ran into the sword before he ran into you. Boy, that would take a pretty brave guy if you've ever seen what a wild boar looks like with the tusks and so forth. But that is, that is what they did. Uh, this beautiful piece also comes with a, with a skinner that matches with ivory grips. And a, and a real treasure here. This is probably from about 1900 in that time. Now we'll go on a little further with imperial weapons. Um, whenever you see uh, a lion head like that, see how it is looking to the side like that? Uh, this is always going to be a Bavarian cutlass. Uh, it has a beautiful uh, stag grip, uh, hunting type cross guards and clamshell. Uh, leather scabbard. It comes also from about the 1900 period and it has its original frog on it uh, but you know collectors will all vouch that uh, a lot of frogs are missing from pieces and that's because uh, in many cases they were only attached by a notch which went under the lug so they came off very easily I get more letters and emails from people looking for frogs and unfortunately I can't help them because a lot of my pieces don't have frogs either. Now this has a uh, just a plain blade but it's in real nice condition. Um, this piece was made by WKC and you can tell the vintage of it because the WKC trademark is the single uh, king's head which we know is the 1890-1900 period. So that's, that's an interesting piece. And next, uh, this Hirschfanger uh, also has a Skinner. Uh, it has gilded fittings instead of um, normally Hirschfangers will have um, uh, silver fittings. Uh, because this was a specially made uh, cutlass, it's quite beautiful. It has a, a triple etch blade, but it also has blue ribbons with um, a gold dedication. And it was actually giving, given to uh, the Silesian uh, hunting group uh, from the company that made their u uniforms. See this name here? So apparently they ordered so darn many uniforms that the company must have felt uh, that it was only good business to maybe give the organization a cutlass uh, to hang in their, uh, in their building. A very beautiful thing. The other side is, is um, uh, got the normal uh, hunting forestry type uh, etches. Incidentally, this was made by Carl Eichhorn and it has a trademark with just an oval, single oval circle with a squirrel and we can date that to around the middle 20s. So that's when that one comes from. Okay, and uh, 
during the imperial period, of course, there were a lot of um, wealthy people that belonged to these clubs. And um, because of that, you'll see some really, uh, really terrific, terrific pieces. Because you could buy whatever you want, whatever your pocketbook would, would let you do. Now, in the case of this piece, another beautiful Hirschfanger, all in silver, uh, with a skinner, with a pigskin brown leather scabbard, ivory grip, and ivory grip plates on the uh, on the skinner. And then, when you remove the the cutlass. Look at that wonderful damask blade. Just incredible. And it's just as nice on the other side. Now this blade doesn't have a maker mark, but what it does have is the name of the company uh, that this aristocrat ordered it from. It was a retailer in Berlin that obviously they sold hunting uniforms and you could also buy cutlasses there. So something like this um, would even, even during those times was a pretty pricey thing. And then to make it even nicer, uh, our, our friend also got a matching Damascus Skinner to go with it. Just beautiful, beautiful things. And this would come from around the 1900 period. And I'll show you one more from the same period. Uh, this is a Saxon cutlass. And you can tell by the initials on the clamshell that was a monogram of the Saxon king. Uh, this also is in silver. Um, the grips are ivory, same on the skinner. And it also has a uh, brown pigskin uh, leather scabbard shell. And like the other one, this one is very glorious too, uh, also in Damascus steel. Beautiful, in mint condition. And the same on the reverse. Just a lovely, lovely thing. Let's see if he scrimped a little on the Skinner. Yeah, he scrimped on the Skinner, that's not Damascus, but uh, I guess his pocketbook gave out uh, on the Hirsch finger blade. So these are the kinds of things that you'll see during the imperial period. Um, there are literally thousands of different examples and models and uh, uh, the amount of work on them can be extraordinary down to just plain surfaces. And again, it was according to the, the pocketbook of the owner. But um, imperial cutlasses are extremely interesting, uh, easily one of the most beautiful uh, edged weapons produced uh, by the Germans. A lot of handwork went into them. So next we'll go into the um, uh, the pieces that come up during the third Reich time. Okay, collectors, next we're going to talk about the uh, third Reich uh, hunting pieces. And everybody knows who the hunting master was, the Jägermeister Hermann Göring. And uh, he ran that organization uh, with strict regulations, uh, everything above board. And he was probably the best man to run it because, as everyone knows, uh, uh, I guess other than eating, his most uh, fun thing was to, uh, to go hunting. So around 1935 was when the, um, the Deutsche Jäger was uh, nationalized, and uh, that's when we begin to see hunting Hirschfangers uh, with the um, Third Reich insignia on the grip. Um, I'll show you a couple to, to wet, your, wet your lips a little bit. Uh, uh, this is a, um, a standard uh, hunting cutlass. 
Um, but what's so great about it, just look at the size of the stag that was used to make this grip. Just fantastic. Most of the time you'll see stag that curves slightly to the left and sometimes even more extreme. And one thing that you want to see on these cutlasses, the fittings and the grip should be very close to the same size. If you see a grip that has been cut extremely to fit a pommel, that's not a good sign. That was the type of stuff that they did after the war, not before the war. The grips and the, and the fittings were very close with very little cutting. And then of course the insignia of the deer, the stag with the um, uh, aura between his horns and the swastika clamshell. Uh, the fittings are normally silvered. The scabbards are um, green leather on hunting pieces. And uh, they normally have a triple etch blade, which is the case on uh, this example. Um, beautiful hunting scenes on both sides of the blade. A lot of the hunting scenes are, scenes are redundant. We see the same ones on many cutlasses. Um, some are marked, some are not marked. This particular piece is unmarked, um, probably because it was sold in a uniform store, but a, a fantastic example. I'll show you another one that's um, slightly different. Uh, this. This piece was made by Pack, and you don't see a lot of um, Pack pieces. Uh, the grip is a lot slimmer here, but again, it could have been fatter if that was the stag that they had. Uh, with the insignia on it, the clamshell, the leather scabbard, and again, a, uh, a typical, uh, beautiful uh, etched hunting scene blade. And this one is marked, I believe, yeah, it has the, uh, the uh, Siegfried Waffen uh, along with the pack name. Probably from about 1936 in that era. And I'll show you one more standard piece. Um, this example was made by the Alcozo form, firm. And notice again the grip turning to the left, that beautiful thing, the insignia. And what Alcozo did that uh, no other maker did on their standard cutlasses, the pommel has oak leaves and acorns that ride all the way over to the final edge. You see how that is? It's, it's quite beautiful the way, the way it was done. And uh, you can compare it to what is more or less a standard pommel where they have just those umbrella-like lines that uh, run out. And when you see an Alcozo hunting piece, that's the kind of pommel that you want to see on it. And again, the, uh, the beautiful uh, etched hunting scene blade. And on the other side, the same. They also, um, they did the ridge the spine with uh, usually oak leaf etching or laurel leaves. And uh, this one has the, um, the Alcozo trademark uh, from 1937 through 1939. So if you get used to um, identifying the vintage of trademarks, it'll also help you a lot with collecting these kinds of weapons. And then the uh, the coup de gras of um, hunting pieces. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the deluxe um, highest cost example that was made by the Carl Eichhorn firm. Um, it's shorter than most. It seems like the higher, the more expensive cutlasses were always shorter. Uh, but again, you have um, a beautiful oak leafing that goes around the uh, pommel. The top is a little fancier than the normal umbrella type with a, a simulated acorn to hold the tang. And look how beautiful the grip fits the stag. 
hardly any trimming at all. Uh, that, that's, that's what you want to see. Uh, the cross guards is beautifully um, uh, with raised oak leaves and uh, a game bird clamshell on the branch. And then on the scabbard tip, Icorn used a very fancy um, stamping with a, with a stag and a glen and finished it with a, with a beautiful um, a bowl type pommel, has little balls that, that go around it. And this one uh, happens to uh, have the frog too. And then it has a, a short blade uh, with uh, hunting scenes, very beautifully done. And on the case of this example, on the uh, spine is the name of the store that sold it, Michibus from Gotbus. Uh, apparently they had a great relationship with Icorn because we will see a lot of hunting pieces uh, with their name on the spine. And then it has the 1935 through 1941 trademark. And you'll notice it is stamped. It's stamped. Remember that. It is not etch. It is stamped. And I'll talk about this uh, in a minute when we talk a little bit about uh, reproductions. Uh, but this is about the best you can get in a um, Third Reich hunting cutlass. Just uh, simply, simply beautiful. So that's the, the basics of the um, Third Reich Hirschfangers. And then we also see the um, forestry cutlasses. Now the forestry um, organization was also extremely important uh, in Germany because um, they were in charge of um, conserving the game lands. Uh, they were very similar to the rangers in America and the foresters would make sure that uh, the hunters had the proper licenses, they would inspect the the creeks and streams, the conditions of the forest, and also the amount of um, animals that were there and the type of animals. And of course they had restrictions on how many of a certain breed you could shoot, uh, just like we do today. That, that stuff was uh, uh, done by the Germans hundreds of years ago. They started conservation for hunting animals. So the forestry cutlasses, you see them you see them in two forms. Um, you see them with um, with ivory or bone grips, and you'll also see them with stag grips. Now the difference was that the um, the white grip was worn by a senior uh, forestry official and the stag grip was worn by a junior man. Now in the case of um, this uh, stag grip example, uh, it's also the top of the icorn line and it has the same uh, clamshell as the Hirschfanger that I showed you. See that, they're both, both the same. Only of course the forestry pieces were in brass, not silver. And it also has the stamped uh, fitting at the bottom of it. Um, this piece uh, has a knot on it and a frog, and the blade is still in incredible condition. Uh, just fantastic with the hunting scenes and and uh, the oak leaves on the top of the spine and more hunting scenes on the reverse. And of course the grip plates are absolutely beautiful. Look at the color in them and just incredible. They usually have three acorn nuts on each side which can vary from piece to piece. Um, on this senior example, uh, you can tell who made this right off the bat because if you notice the the leaves run from large to small on the grip. There's only one producer that did that, and uh, that was um, WKC. And this particular piece, too, was um, 
top of the line. So I'll just show you the, the blade on that. It's very, very nice. So that's the, the basic types. And then you'll just to look at a couple of others. Um, here's a subordinate forestry. Again, with the, the beautiful stag grip. This one's got the knot on it and the, um, and the frog. Um, got a lot of gilt left on it too. Uh, this, this piece was made by Alcozo. See there, that, that's the little, that trademark's a little bit later. That's about 1939 or 40. Incidentally, they, Normally the fittings on the scabbards of these cutlasses, because they were leather, are retained by staples. On later pieces, sometimes you will see screws in the side, but mostly it's staples. And I've even seen on later pieces where the scabbard will be metal. It's unusual, but you do see it. Now, forestry cutlasses normally uh, do not have any uh, swastika on them. But later in the period, about 1939 or so, uh, apparently the factories decided that it was high time to, uh, to give the national insignia some usage. Uh, so there were a few firms that made um, cutlasses with a eagle and swastika built into the furrow. Can you see that? Uh, the firms you see with this are, uh, oh, Wiresburg did it, um, Horster did it, uh, Holler did it too, um, or a lot of them will be unmarked, which, which this one is uh, an unmarked piece with a beautiful blade. And these are quite rare and, and because of that they, uh, they can get pretty, pretty pricey and there's a lot of reproductions of them. Um, if you're going to uh, buy one of these um, a no maker is usually you're in good shape, uh, but if you see the mark of say um, holler uh, and it's etched, not stamped, uh, it is a post-war piece. Um, this stamping business is uh, is very important, and we'll go into it a little a little further in in a minute. All right, and one more forestry piece. Um, which is extremely beautiful. Look at the gilt that remains on the brass fittings and the, the beautiful uh, stag grip. The, the uh, leather is almost in new condition. Uh, this was not the top of the line model, but it's, this model is listed in the Icorn uh, catalog. But what's really great about it, feast your eyes on that beauty. It has all blue and gold hunting scene etchings on a damask blade. Really gorgeous. And then on the other side it it has a, um, a dedication uh, where the piece was um, was given uh, to the uh, uh, West Fallon uh, Hunting Association uh, and it comes from uh, uh, the hunting group per se and it has the um, trademark of Carl Eichhorn 35 to 41 um, on the Mercasso. And it's probably in such good condition as more than likely a piece like this would have been hung in the game hall uh, for, to brag about because it's so beautiful. So you can see there's uh, lots, of, lots of different uh, attributes with these daggers. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of others that um, I like, and I think you will too. Uh, this piece, it's a big, heavy Hirschfanger in, in, in gilting. Um, it was made by the, uh, the pack firm, and it also has a nice, um, nice skinning knife with it, as you can see. But what's terrific about this piece is that on the, um, 
on the lower mount. So get it right here. Yeah, um, uh, this piece was was presented to Hans uh, Rottenhuber, and Rottenhuber was an SS uh, storm bottom fuhrer. But he was a lot more than that. He was also head of um, Hitler's personal security. Uh, during the whole time of Hitler's reign, uh, this piece was given to Rottenhuber uh, by the uh, Deutsche Jägerschaft, the German Hunting Association. And um, I would think that uh, if I was in uh, business, uh, I would want to give Rottenhuber something too because uh, who wants Hitler's chief of security not to like you? So uh, uh, this is a very special piece that I've had for oh many, many years, and, uh, and I really love it. It's also made by Pack, which is kind of unusual. It has a, a beautiful blade on it with the normal hunting scenes, and on the reverse, uh, more hunting scenes, and the um, Siegfried uh, hammering figure there. And then one other piece before we leave the uh, hunting stuff. Um, this is a, a wonderful Hirschfanger. It's all in silvered fittings with a skinner. Uh, but look at the pommel. What happened here? It doesn't have the usual pommel. Well, if you look closely, you can see that it's a stylized uh, bird, um, specifically being uh, uh, a falcon. And there were falconry hunting in Germany also. Uh, only the very, very wealthy uh, could do it because you would have to have birds and a, and a uh, hunting master to maintain the birds and trade the bird, train the birds. So it's very unusual uh, to see one of these. Um, this beautiful piece was made by Henkels. It's in their catalog from the 1920s, which I have a copy of. Um, the blade is, um, is a standard hunting scene type blade with all the, the same features that you normally see. Uh, just a, a, a beautiful thing and Henkels name is on the uh, Ricasso. Henkels is still in business today, by the way. And the Skinner is also nice that goes with it. This is a very, very rare Hirschfanger. Just imagine how, how many falconry people could there have been during the Reich period. Okay, well next we're going to, um, we're going to talk about shooting cutlasses. So that's the, uh, uh, Shooting, shooting associations in Germany uh, also go back for centuries. Uh, and they were a yearly event in all the little towns and villages uh, where they would have a shooting contest. Uh, and then afterwards, they'd have a parade and they'd all gather the whole village in a tent and uh, eat lots of Weisswurst and sauerkraut and sauerbraten and drink plenty of beer with a numpa band. So I kind of think that uh, the shooting fest was really just an excuse uh, for the whole town to get together and, and have a party. It's in the summertime. And the shooting clubs, the person who won the, uh, the event, uh, they had a chain with lots of links on it. The name of the town or city, usually in the center, uh, and the winner each year, his name was engraved uh, on the back of one of the links. Um, and as the chains would fill up over the years, they would start another chain. Uh, but some German towns, they have these chains that go back to the late 1700s. And they still do this today. The guy that won the tournament, he gets to wear the chain for a year. Then he's got to give it to the next champion. So. The uh, shooting associations, at least from the Third Reich standpoint of view, um, they didn't really establish a model uh, 
or the Third Reich until about 1939. And what they consisted of, it's a, a nickel-plated um, cutlass, usually aluminum fittings underneath. Uh, they had a, a wood um, grip, carved grip, that was covered with celluloid. And these cutlasses suffer the same problem as naval daggers uh, in that the uh, celluloid cracks over the years. See, here's an example of that. Sometimes you'll see cracks that run down and there'll be pieces missing out of it. And it's almost impossible uh, to find one of these cutlasses uh, that has an intact grip. Then a pair of rifles were inserted over the grip and it has a pommel that's very similar to a Hirschfanger style pommel with a ferrule and a cross guard. And the cross guard has an applied insignia which has the name of the organization uh, written around the perimeter uh, separated by little tiny swastikas. They're the only swastikas on the piece. And then there's a target in the, in the, in the center of a bird in the middle. And then what these cutlasses did, they had etched blades, but the etches are different than we would see on a hunting piece. Uh, on this you can see there's a, a target featured on it. Now this particular piece is by Alcozo, and uh, this is the motif that they used on their blade. Um, their trademark is on the back there. It's a trademark from about 1940. And you also notice with all these cutlasses, the, the grain changes about an inch up from the ricasso. I don't know whether you can see that, but there's a change in the grain on both sides. And uh, I think it, uh, it was probably because of the length of the blade, perhaps. Uh, the etch didn't work right. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why, but you, you see it a lot. And on um, the Alcoso forms of these, if the camera can see it, uh, the insignia is held on by rivets. Can we see that in there? Yeah. Okay, on a, I'll show you another piece. Uh, this is an icorn piece and it virtually looks identical to the Alcozo on the outside. Uh, and this particular piece is, it's unbelievable, but the grip never broke. Uh, I've only seen two or three of them over the years where the grip has never broken. So, and Icorn did things a little bit differently. Their etch, their etch has a, uh, a target uh, but it is on the reverse side and it's done differently than the Alcozo. I'll try to put the two next to each other so you can see it. See the differences in the two? I hope you can see that. And also with the, uh, the icorn piece, the insignia is not held by rivets it just has prongs in the back that are that are turned over. And what's interesting about this piece too, it uh, let's see, that's not the right scabbard. This must be the right scabbard. There's a um, there's a dedication to the um, uh, to the boss of the shooting club for his marriage in uh, 1940, I think it says. Makes it kind of cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some, some uh, other things that you can also collect with these that, that make it interesting. Uh, there were also miniatures that were made for hunting pieces. Um, the type you generally see is this type. Um, they're made by the Horster firm. 
and uh, the scabbard is simulated leather. It's actually all metal, and the grip is also all metal. And then they have the hunting insignia with the swastika on the grip. And then the blade is, uh, is also etched, just like, a, uh, just like a, a real piece would be. They're very, very nice. Uh, I mean, a great, a great letter opener. Uh, there's the Horster trademark on the reverse. And also nice to put next to your, your cutlass. And then there's another version that um, only Alcozo made this. And this is a miniature of their top-of-the-line uh, Hirschfanger. And it has real stag grip, real silvered fittings. And since it's Alcozo, it's got the leaves that come all the way over. Remember I told you that? And the, uh, the scabbard is leather with silver mounts and also a beautiful um, etch blade on it. And that has the Alcozo, uh, Alcozo stamp on the on the back of it. So that's some of the things that uh, that you can collect on that. And then there's other other items that um, uh, you can add uh, just to show off your things a little bit. Uh, this is uh, these are all cigar clippers which would have been used in the hunting lodge. After the big hunt, everybody sat down for uh, uh, refreshments and cigars. So this piece is actually, um, uh, it looks like a small uh, elephant tusk or maybe some other uh, animal, but it, it has a, the silver crest of its um, original owner on it, which I've never been able to identify. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. This next piece uh, I like a lot. It's a, it has a stag body to it and the cigar clipper is in the center uh, and the head of it is all in a beautiful hunting dog, all in silver. Very, 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 very beautiful. And then this next piece is um, uh, made out of a boar's tusk with silver mounts. Must have been a pretty big boar to have a tusk that big. But that's very beautiful. And then this is one of the favorite pieces in my collection. It's a boar's tusk with a boar's head all carved in silver with little red jeweled eyes. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And if you wanted to clip your cigar, you just push up the boar's mouth. Isn't that cool? I just love it. Next we're going to talk a little bit about um, reproductions and I hope you guys will pay attention to a lot of these things because they're very very important. You know if you lay down a couple thousand dollars and, uh, and find out that what you bought uh, was made in 1968 uh, that is not fun. So I want to try to help you as much as I can. Um, the first thing I'll show you, I mean, boy, look at this. You just got to have it, don't you? You just got to have it. Look at that box. Tremendous with a hunting insignia on the corners and a, and a Wehrmacht swastika in the middle. Don't ask me what a Wehrmacht swastika would be doing on a... Uh, on a hunting box, and uh, maybe that's one of the things that you have to be a little leery of to begin with. Then you open it up. Oh, please, I gotta have that. Oh, it's just, this will, it just bowls you over. I mean, look at that. It's just, it is fantastic. It's got a Icorn Deluxe high end cutlass sitting in there. But is it really? Let me show you something here. Uh, right, okay. Now, this is the piece that I showed you in the lecture, and this is the piece that's in that box. And wow, they look they look identical, don't they? They really do. They look identical. 
and then you take it out of the, the scabbard and wow, it's got a beautiful etched hunting scene blade. See that? It looks great, doesn't it? Now the one problem, remember I told you, you don't want to see an etch there. You want to see a stamp, an icorn stamp. Can you see that that's an etch? Now I'm going to get the other piece out and show you the two next to each other so you can really see what the difference is because it's very, very important. There's the stamp. And left the etch. Can you see those differences? Now also, on the original hunting cutlass, uh, the action on the blade is running towards the tip. I hope we can see that. See, it's running towards the tip. Now on the 60s piece, the action is actually running towards the hilt. So those two things alone can save you a, a lot of money uh, on buying a bad piece. But I'm going to show you one other thing too that you can take to the bank on an original piece or a copy. Now, if you look at these bottom fittings, you'll notice that on the original, which is on the right, uh, look at the amount of horns that are on the stag. And notice this little one right here. On the copy, the little one is not there. And it seems to be 100% uh, on that. I can show you on uh, an icorn cutlass, uh, forestry cutlass too. Um, if you look at the bottom here, you'll also see that that little horn is there. It's a little, little, tiny, tiny, tiny thing, but boy, that can save you a fortune if you know it. Now, what all other things you have to look for, um, many of the 60s cutlasses and Hirschfangers, like I said before, the uh, grip on the Hirschfangers is too heavily trimmed. They had to trim it so much to fit the fittings that they had. Remember, the real ones were not that way. Uh, the same was true on the uh, forestry pieces where the, um, the stag is trimmed too much. And you'll see that, and it's also a lot of times too thick. Other things to look for, um, uh, I see a lot of uh, horster uh, hunting cutlasses and they use uh, the trademark of the H with the small H and S in the middle of the large H that's pierced by a sword. You know that trademark? Well, if that's not stamped if it's etched. I'm sorry, your blade is not period. Um, like I told you too with holler, uh, many holler pieces will have etched uh, holler trademarks. The real ones were stamped. Uh, before I leave the uh, reprodu before I leave the reproduction section, uh, I just want to show you one more piece. And please don't anybody get stuck on something like this. I mean, look at this thing. This is outrageous. I mean, how can you resist it? Boy, you got a huge raised swastika on the clamshell, and an eagle and swastika in the furrow. Uh, it just goes oh. Oh, I gotta have that. I gotta have that. Um, 
Then you look at the blade, and oh my God, it's got an artificial Damascus blade with a, with a gold eagle on it. Wow. And then you turn it over. Oh, and of course, it's from the, Mar the Reich Marshal himself, Hermann Goering. And it's something where he's giving it to his friend Paul. And then the trademark is the dead giveaway, P.D. Lunerschloss. Uh, whenever you see that on something alleged this magnificent, um, it's, it's the kiss of death. Um, these things, uh, a lot of them were made in the 60s and the 70s, and uh, they're very well done. And uh, how can you resist it? I mean, it's great. Just look at it. Oh, my God. But remember what I told you, some of the things that you look for. The grip plates are too big on this, too. They're too fat. That's a one giveaway. Um, we don't see swastikas on clamshells on Third Reich pieces normally. There are a few that do exist, but they're so rare, the chances of you and I ever finding one are, are pretty real, pretty unrealistic, and especially not for $1,000 or something that uh, is going to be the price on something like this. Um, it just, uh, another thing they did too, they used, they used uh, one of the Icorn bottom fittings with the stag and the Glen. Remember I told you about them? And of course it doesn't have the, uh, the little piece in the stag horn. So just, you know, when you, when you just about fall over seeing a piece, it's just, oh, I gotta uh, stop. Go in the bathroom, take a leak or something, and come back and look at it, at it again and try to remember some of these things that I've been telling you. There's a lot of other subtleties, but I mean, it would take days to, to go through uh, all of the things. But um, these are some of the some of the basics here that I think will um, I think will help you if you remember them. I hope the camera picked up everything. And like I like to do, I want to show you some pictures, and then we'll end the lecture. Well, I just want to show you some pictures, again, so you don't think I'm wolfing you. They actually wore these things uh, in this first photograph. Uh, this great looking guy with his, uh, with his goatee and a cigar, good man. Uh, you can see that he's wearing a Hirschfanger here with a knot. Uh, this comes from the imperial time, uh, probably about 1910, something like that. And of course, he's got his great Jaeger hut on. Uh, he's very, very proud of himself, and I'm sure he deserved to be. Great looking outfit there. Next is a, um, a Third Reich uh, hunter. And you can see that he's a um, professional hunter by the uh, insignia on his sleeve there. And he's wearing a Hirschfanger with a knot that you can see fairly clearly there. And here's another professional hunter. Uh, you can't see the Hirschfanger too good, but he's wearing that special knot that, um, that professional hunters wore. It was a, uh, a silver bullion and it had uh, twin uh, thin green stripes that ran down its length. It's a really rare knot. You can spend a thousand bucks on that knot if you can find one. And he's got his outfit on with his hunting hat. In this next picture, uh, here's our our sponsor, Herman Goering, uh, just finishing up a hunt here, and and there's some of his buddies uh, with him, and you can see that this fella holding up this huge rack that I guess Goering shot. Uh, he's wearing a uh, a Hirschfanger. A great shot. And in this picture, here you can see a forestry cutlass being worn with the knot, and it's a senior cutlass because you can see it has the white ivory or bone grips. And then we always have to have our wedding pictures with these vivacious brides. Uh, and this 
forestry man. He's a subordinate, and you'll see that he's wearing a subordinate cutlass. Uh, and you can even tell by the shape of the clamshell that that's a WKC piece, at least I can. This shot's a little light, but um, uh, here you see an Army NCO uh, wearing a forestry cutlass. I see many cutlasses that have NCO Army knots tied around them, and I always wondered why, and um, maybe there's more to this picture than we know, and maybe it would explain why uh, we see Army NCO uh, trottles worn on some of the cutlasses. But you can clearly see that that's a subordinate cutlass. And there's Herman. I told you about the falcons. Of course, Herman was wealth wealthy enough to have falcons. And there he is in one of his favorite poses. And I just wonder whether the uh, hunting sprig that he's wearing in that hat is the one that I have upstairs that I showed you last time. I later found out that this, these were not, at least on Goring's scale, they were not made of uh, boar hair, uh, but were actually made from the hair of the rare animal, a chamois. And it took three chamois to make that sprig that Goring wears, wears on his hat. And then just one more, here's another, another guy with a falcon. So they definitely had falconry in Germany. So I think that's uh, that's about all I uh, all I have to say. My son, cameraman Robbie, his arms get pretty tired after a while, so we're going to have to going to have to end this lecture. And I hope it was enjoyable for you. I always like doing it. It's uh, it's easy to do, and uh, I don't know what I'll do next time. But uh, there's still still lots of categories yet to go through. And I'll keep doing these things as long as you guys enjoy it. I mean, I get oh, so many, so many emails from people on how much they they do like the seminars. And um, remember, too, if I can help you with anything, if you got questions on something, I'm always available on the email. I'm happy to answer as many emails as come in. Sometimes it takes me two or three days, but I'll get back to you. So thanks a lot, and uh, let's hope that all this mess is over soon and we can all go to a German restaurant and maybe have a, a piece of boar or maybe some venison liver. It's been six or seven months since I've been to a restaurant, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys. So have fun now and see you next time.